Good morning. Good morning. Well, welcome to Clough United Methodist Church. We are so glad you are here in worship with us this morning, uh, where you are invited to come, connect, grow, and serve your roadmap to meaningful purpose. And we say this every uh, Sunday, but I want to reiterate it. You are welcome here, no matter where you have come from and no matter where you're going, no matter what you believe or doubt, no matter what you have or don't have, and no matter whom you love, all of you is work welcomed into this time of worship by God who loves you, knows you by name, and wants a personal relationship with you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. So a few announcements. This, uh, this is the beginning of the new appointment year in the church. And so uh, I will be entering officially this, well, the 1st of July, I will be entering my seventh year here. It's like, well, where did that time go? <laughs> right? Thank you, my seventh year. And, and uh, Jennifer will be entering her first year in the California Pacific uh, uh, Conference. And she and her family are... Uh, they, they left and went to, they're going to be in Pennsylvania for two weeks, and then they're going to drive from Pennsylvania all the way to California because uh, she doesn't have to be uh, in the pulpit or on her assignment till later on in July because she's not the lead pastor, amen? But her appointment starts July 1. So <laughs> we pray for all the pastors that have new appointments and ha who are reappointed. I also want to let you know that there is going to be a Bible study on the Psalms. We're using uh, Max Lucado's book, and it's going to be at 10 o'clock on Wednesday, starting July 12th. The book is $10. It's going to be at Cherry Grove. So if you have um, the time or the interest, uh, a Bible study on the, on the Psalms, $10 for the book, 10 a.m. At, at Cherry Grove uh, on Wednesday, starting July 12th. All righty. Um, and so you can see uh, in your bulletin uh, that there's an invite for you to make contributions to school supplies. And it's like, didn't the kids just get out of school? You know, and I mean, yeah, they're going to be starting, what, in about, what, six weeks? Five? Yeah, I know, I know. I'm not going to the teachers. Don't listen. La, 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 la. Don't even listen. Um, but uh, so it, as you are able, you know, contribute to the uh, school supplies that Jack's Closet needs. And then Aaliyah is going to come forth. She has an announcement. Hello. So if you check out the blue paper in your bulletin, um, we've got VBS coming up. The last week of July, it's Monday through Friday, 5.30 to 7.30 each night. Firstly, I just want to say, don't hand this copy out to anybody. The part that says register online still has the sample email instead of the one that it should have. So I'm going to get the new one to Amy, and then you can hand them out next week. <laughs> but just throw this one away. Um, secondly, though, if I have not talked to you about volunteering for VBS and you are able to or you would like to, please either catch me after church or email me or text me so I can get you a spot to volunteer for VBS. I think that's it. Well, thank you. Now, um, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, I spoke to leadership about, at least through PPRC, is that uh, in this year that I am appointed here that I will be lifting up more um, social justice issues because uh, we're, we're Wesleyan Methodists and we believe not only in piety, our relationship with Christ vertically, but we also are concerned about the, our relationship with uh, one another. And so there's no, uh, it was, John Wesley said, there's no religion, religion besides a social religion. And so in that realm, I just want you to know that, you know, the Supreme Court um, did a, real, uh, uh, a ruling on affirmative action. I just want you to know that our church has a position um, on that, and I just want to share part of it. Doesn't mean, you know, we have a big tent. Doesn't mean you have to believe in affirmative action or even agree with where our church is positioned, but I, I'd like you to hear what, we, what the agencies have said. It says, and as agencies of the United Methodist Church, we remain committed to the Wesleyan value of social justice 
and the social teachings of the gospel as expressed in our social principles and book re resolutions, and will continue to pursue inclusive and equitable practices in our hiring, programming, and institutional witness. We continue to believe, given the tenacity of many forms of racism, sexism, and ableism, both latent and subtle, the concept of affirmative action retains its relevance as part of an overall effort to create a more just and equitable social system. And we will continue to reflect our own practices and champion to the wider world the kingdom values that seek to ensure access to an effective partnership, participation in all sectors of society for people of color, women, and persons with disabilities. This is from the General Board of Church and Society, General Board of Higher Education and Ministries, General Commission on Religion and Race, and General Commission on the Status and Role of Women. Uh, now, you don't have to agree, just wanted to give you a heads up, just in case anyone, particularly maybe some young people might wanna have a discussion about what this means. So I just wanna let you know the position, uh, the official position of our, our church, whether, uh, you know, in terms of the social justice issue. Uh, I, I would also like to say that for affirmative action purposes, I um, started my college education as one of four black women integrating Lindenwood College for Women. So I benefited by uh, affirmative action. Um, didn't finish my uh, education there, finished uh, through Webster University, but nevertheless, I started out in St. Charles, Missouri at Lindenwood College for Women. Amen. <laughs> All right. Okay. So any other announcements to come before the congregation this morning? It's a beautiful morning. How was the Taylor Swift? Where's my Swifties? All right. <laughs> it was a good concert. Glad we had some folks that were able to go and participate. Amen. Well, as, let us just center our hearts now as we prepare our hearts for worship. So whether climbing a treacherous path or walking a journey of grace, we are welcomed, received, and accomp accompanied by God. Christ invites us to do the same for others, whoever they are and wherever they are on life's journey. So please stand as we begin our worship in praise and prayer with our opening song. Let's see. My heart to 
bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing your praise than when we first begun. Stains are washed away, they're washed away. Amen. God of ages past and days yet to come, journey with us today. Journey with us all our days, whether on treacherous paths or beside still waters. Guide our steps to find solid ground that we may know the firm foundation of your constant presence. Open our minds to the blessings and miracles we encounter along the way. In your holy name we pray. Amen? Amen. You may be seated. Are we going to have a moment or no? With children? A moment with a child? No? All right. God, the more we know you, the more it is that joy dances in our souls. So as we open the pages of our family's history, show yourself in its words. Whisper your love in our ears. Draw us into the embrace of your arms. Let our hearts beat a little faster as we hear the sound of your voice so near. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from the book of Romans, chapter 6, verses 12 through 23. So then, don't let sin rule your body so that you do what it wants. Don't offer parts of your body to sin to be used as weapons to do wrong. Instead, present yourselves to God as people who have been brought back to life from the dead and offer all the parts of your body to God to be used as weapons to do right. Sin will have no power over you because you aren't under law, but under grace. So what? Should we sin because we aren't under law, but under grace? Absolutely not. Don't you know that if you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, that you are slaves of the one whom you obey? That's true, whether you serve as slaves of sin, which leads to death, or of slaves of the kind of obedience that leads to righteousness. But thank God that although you used to be slaves of sin, you gave wholehearted obedience to the teaching that was handed down to you, which provides a pattern. Now that you have been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking with ordinary metaphors because of your limitations. Once you offered the parts of your body to be used as slaves to impurity and to lawless behavior that leads to still more lawless behavior, now you should present the parts of your body as slaves to righteousness, which makes your lives holy. 
When you were slaves of sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What consequences did you get from doing things that you are now ashamed of? The outcome of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and become slaves to God, you have the consequence of a holy life, and the outcome is eternal life. The wages that sin pays are death, but God's gift is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The second reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 1 through 23. Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was making more disciples and baptizing more than John, although Jesus' disciples were baptizing, not Jesus himself. Therefore, he left Judea and went to Galilee. Jesus had to go through Samaria. He came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, which was near the land Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Jesus was tired from his journey, so he sat down at the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to the well to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me some water to drink. His disciples had gone into the city to buy him some food. The Samaritan woman asked, why do you, a Jewish man, ask for something to drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Jews and Samaritans didn't associate with each other. Jesus responded, If you recognize God's gift and who is saying to you, give me some water to drink, you would be asking him and he would give you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you don't have a bucket and the well is deep. Where would you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave this well to us, and he drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give will never be thirsty again. The water that I give will become in those who drink it a spring of water that bubbles up into eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will never be thirsty and will never need to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, get your husband and come back here. The woman replied, I don't have a husband. You are right to say you don't have a husband, Jesus answered. You've had five husbands, and the man you are with now isn't your husband. You've spoken the truth. The woman said, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you and your people say that it is necessary to worship in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, the time is coming when you and your people will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You and your people worship what you don't know. We worship what we know because salvation is from the Jews. But the time is coming and is here when true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth. The Father looks for those who worship him this way. The last scripture, John 4, 39 through 42, a continuation of what we've just heard. Many Samaritans in that city believed in Jesus because of the woman's word when she testified. He told me everything I've ever done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, We no longer believe because of what you said, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is truly the Savior of the world. The word of God for the people of God. 
Thanks be to God. Please join us and wade in the water. So we are at the end of this sermon series, um, <clears throat> and the title is, It's Finished, Right? Well, Americans celebrate Independence Day on the 4th of July as a public holiday with fireworks and barbecues and flags and expressions of gratitude for the freedom we have as Americans. And most celebrations of national independence mark the day of final victory in the struggle for freedom. Perhaps it's a mark of our American pride and boldness that we celebrate on July 4th, the signing of the Declaration of Independence, which occurred seven years before the final treaty ending the Revolutionary War on September 3rd, 1783. So we could have had a different date, right? So uh, <clears throat> the Declaration adopted on July 4th, 1776, burn the final bridges of England's authority over America. We cut ties with the monarchy. But the signers of this Declaration of Independence recognized that liberty could not be preserved unless the new nation recognized its dependence on God. In fact, as John Adams signed it, he said, whether we live or die, sink or swim, succeed or fail, I stand behind this Declaration of Independence. And if God wills it, I am ready to die in order that this country might 
experience freedom. And the closing words of the Declaration solemnly states, with a firm reliance on the protection and divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. The brave men who initiated and signed it realized that genuine freedom comes only through reliance on the Almighty. Do you consider yourself to be truly free? Whether you live in a free country or not, are you free on the inside? Are you free from guilt and fear? Are you free from the fear of death and from the eternal consequences of your actions? Are you free from addictions, greed, and other sinful passions that have become beyond your control? Well, when I uh, was preparing for this sermon, there, there was only one scripture, the, the ones that we read from John, that were associated with this sermon uh, uh, and from the series from, from, the, uh, from the pastor, uh, Reverend Butler. But I looked at the lectionary, and so the, the scripture from Romans was part of the lectionary. And I couldn't help but see, find a way to encompass both of these scriptures because the freedom that, uh, that Paul is talking about, the freedom from sin, is something that the woman at the well experienced, right? And it is also ties into the freedom um, that people who are going through a recovery program experience as, they, as the shackles of addiction are lifted from them. And then, of course, it is the 4th of July weekend, so why not talk about freedom anyway, all right? So <clears throat> the thing is, uh, though, um, part of what Romans is talking about is, uh, is that our freedom, the freedom that we get from sin is all about the grace, the sanctifying grace of God. It does not mean that the freedom we get is a one-time thing, and it's over and done with. Um, you know, many uh, churches experience this. Children uh, have their initial baptism, you know, when they're born, and then they go through confirmation. And a lot of folks feel that they, once they go through confirmation, well, it's finished. They don't have to do Christian education anymore. It's done, one-time deal. They know their faith. They've been confirmed, and they've graduated. They've now graduated. Uh, it's finished. Their spiritual growth is finished. And then a study uh, was made that showed that most Christians in the, in the churches in the United States have about a sixth grade education and understanding of the faith. Because they stopped, right, at confirmation. They haven't sought Christian education as adults. And we know how hard it is. All right, I'm going to try to guilt you into uh, coming to Bible study. So uh, any of you all that are free during the day, on a Wednesday, amen. Can I get an amen? Uh, I know, that's all right. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to guilt you into that. But I am just saying that uh, we have a robust, you know, Sunday school, uh, adult Sunday school here. So I know that we're getting good Christian uh, adult education. Nevertheless, I mean, it, it's that is what's happening in the church. So using, getting back to the text then, using the images of slavery and freedom, Paul, who is the uh, writer of Romans, declares that true freedom is one where believers are liberated from sin and at the same time to announce believers' accountability to God. And freedom from sin does not mean that human beings are free to do as they please. However, I found this illustration. It said a preacher announced that there were, set, he was preaching on sin, on a sermon on sin. He said there's 789 different sins. How he knew this, I do not know. But he says, uh, he writes, a few days later, the mailman delivered 94 requests from members of the congregation for a list of the 789 sins. <laughs> it's funny, but so typical of human behavior. Let me see. Let's go down the list. Okay, that one's not on it. So <clears throat> the crux of Paul's exhortation is that we are always slaves in one sense or, an, or, uh, or free in another. 
The only question is whether the slavery is to God or to unrighteousness, whether the freedom is from righteousness or from sin. Slavery to sin brings death, and slavery to righteousness brings sanctification, which in turn is God's gift of holiness to believers. We as Wesleyans believe in the sanctifying grace of God. We believe in just prevenient grace that goes before, that's out there where God is trying to pursue us. We believe in justifying grace when we make the commitment uh, to follow God, to follow God and Jesus, and then sanctifying grace is the Holy Spirit's empowerment of us to live sanctified lives, to learn right from wrong, to learn how to repent, to learn how to refrain from sin. So sanctification is a lifelong journey of faith. It is never finished on this side of eternity. And Paul is simply reminding his readers that obedience is essential uh, to slavery and that righteousness is basically synonymous with life. Yet to whatever else slavery to righteousness and obedience may refer, it almost certainly means full-bodied and a life commitment to them. Jesus' followers aren't slaves to disobedience and righteousness in the same way that we're slaves to God. However, the Spirit empowers us to offer our whole persons to obedience and righteousness. So Christians might think of ourselves as being mastered by them. And so you see, so this sanctification is for Christians, but it, but it is part of the 12-step program, is to get folks who are in recovery, uh, who, who are slaves to alcohol or whatever addiction, to become slaves to repent and become slaves to righteousness. Right? Now, Reverend Butler summarizes uh, step 12 this way. As we meet God on our journey, he changes us, and the reaction is to bring others to him. Yes, we are not done yet. He writes this. Think about the first time you really realized you had enough of life addicted to alcohol, drugs, porn, caffeine, nicotine, or double-stuffed Oreo cookies. Oh, somebody's guilty. It's not the brightest moment in life, is it? Whatever the drug of choice, it has removed choice from our lives, and we are no longer free. In fact, those first two questions every person in recovery needs to be asked ring loudly. Have you had enough? Are you ready to go to any lengths, including listening to the directions of another, even when you think it's stupid, so that you can stay clean and sober? It is in this moment that life is dark. Darkness symbolizes being low, depressed, or evil. However, in reality, it's just the absence of light. Even the smallest light can be seen clearly when it's dark. And so we have the story of the Samaritan woman. In that story, John is drawing contrast between Nicodemus, if you remember him, the Jerusalem leader with name, rank, and education who comes to Jesus by night in the dark. And the woman of Samaria who, without rank or status, comes to Jesus in the full light of day. So the story of the woman of the well means more if you know more of the background. So let me just remind you of that. The woman at the well was a Samaritan. And she was considered unclean because when the Jews were deported to Assyria, her ancestors who remained behind intermarried with the Gentiles. This made her parents and all their offspring tainted. Samaritans were considered half-breeds, and while they may have believed in God, the God of the Bible, they were considered traitors to God and his plan for the nation of Israel. In addition, the woman from the well had been married five times. And this created another problem. 
A failed marriage would have signaled to the community that the woman was incapable of fulfilling her wifely duties and it was shameful. Now you know what the wifely duties was, right? It was to produce an heir. So she's been married five times. She has not been able to produce an heir. And then the man, you know, she's living with is not a husband. For a woman to have been married and divorced multiple times, she would have been a social outcast. Most would have thought of her as a, uh, an illicit woman, one who was giving herself to any man to avoid starvation. In a society where women have very little rights and was considered property, not many would have spoken to her unless they wanted something from her. And this makes Jesus' willingness to approach, talk, listen, and share himself with her so astounding. It also makes his action on her behalf nothing short of a miracle. He was her light in a life of darkness. Now, many of us have seen the miracles of a program of recovery. I'm an adult child of alcoholic. There may be others here um, uh, that are adult children of alcoholics, or you have alcoholic relatives, some who have gone through recovery, some who are still active alcoholics. But Butler explains, we've seen the addict recover and regain life even after so many people have written them off as waste. So go into any recovery meeting and see people who were cured from a hopeless state of mind and body. The miracles sit before you. They might have been crazed and insane, but today they look like lawyers, teachers, bankers, tradesmen, truck drivers, stay-at-home moms, and responsible business people. Their lives shine the same way Jesus' miracles were shining. Their shine tells us there is a way out. It is this hope that the program of recovery begins and then rejuvenates itself over and over again. He said, he writes, a good friend who died with 39 years of sobriety said to me, recovery is a program of unlimited spiritual growth. On the path, there will be many different levels, some you will rest in for a while. Some you will climb quickly because the path is bright. Others you will struggle because you are getting rid of some baggage you didn't need. In all cases, you will be growing. He said, I love hearing him say this to me, partly because every time I experienced a new level of spiritual growth and thought it was the coolest, I realized there was still more. Repentance. Repentance is, a, is hearty sorrow for our past misdeeds and a sincere resolution and an endeavor to the utmost of our power to conform our actions to the law of God. It does not consist of one single act of sorrow, it, but do, in doing works we meet in doing works, meet for repentance in a sincere obedience to the law of Christ for the remainder of our lives, so writes John Locke. Right? Repentance is not a one-time thing. It's over and over. We're not finished. Remember that? Don't put a period where God puts a comma. Right? The woman at the well had a spiritual awakening, and once she did, there was no being silent. I mean, it was like the fire was shut up in her bones, right? She couldn't help but go back to the village and share her excitement about her time with Jesus. In doing so, others wanted to meet him, and he ended up staying for two days. And through the symbol of living water, Jesus reveals himself as the one who offers universal salvation to all, regardless of race, accident of birth, or gender. He offers new life for all. That is the good news we have to offer the world as we strive to make disciples for the transformation of the world. Well, the 12 steps build to the same type of awakening. And once you have the Holy Spirit in your life, the power gets unleashed to propel one to even more activity, which is then nurtured through the steps. As a result, we change. 
You become more willing to serve and less worried about who cares or who knows. You mature in your understanding of God in such a way that you serve not because you have to, but because you want to. And you want to not for selfish reasons, but in gratitude for what God and others have done for you. In many ways, this is also the path many of us have followed. The program that saves your life becomes a program you volunteer in as recognition of the gratitude you have for your unmerited gift of life. May that be a community of faith or a community of, or a program of recovery. Let's face it, many of us are walking dead in this morning if we ever got what we deserved. Oh, can I say that again? We are the walking dead if we ever got what we deserve. We're all saved by grace, amen? And there's no big sin or little sin. All the sins, whether they're white lies or big lies, are sins, right? And so if we got what we deserve, but we didn't. We didn't get what we deserve, and we don't. God gave us something we didn't deserve, a life in which we can hold our heads up high because he loved us enough to forgive us of all our sins and help us set our lives straight and allow us to help others as a show of our gratitude. So Christians may debate about the ways um, that slavery to sin, Satan, and death manifests itself. We don't all agree, but there is little arguing that our eternal well-being is a gracious gift from God. So, this 4th of July, may we celebrate with joy the freedoms and privileges we possess, both as citizens of this great nation and hopefully also as citizens of the kingdom of God. So as we celebrate again the birth of our nation, pray that our country might have a new birth of freedom, not a freedom from God, which always leads to death, but rather a freedom built upon God and God's commandments to love God with all the fabric of our being and love others as we love ourselves. And also may each one of us as individuals reaffirm our dependence upon God so that looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, we might experience the freedom he gives not only from worry, not only from doubt and fear, but also from all those sins which so easily beset us. Are we finished? I think not. We've only just begun. Amen? Amen. So now we're going to sing Holy Spirit. Oh, 
hear this invitation to Christ. Come, my light, and illumine my darkness. Come, my life, and revive me from death. Come, my physician, and heal my wounds. Come, flame of divine love, and burn up the thorns of my sins, kindling my heart with the flame of thy love. Come, my king, sit upon the throne of my heart and reign there, for thou alone art my king and my Lord. Amen. Our prayer of confession. Lord, we know that you have freed us from being slaves to sin, but of our own free will we still wander from the pathway you have shown to be the right way. Forgive our weakness, we pray, and through your Holy Spirit, help us to make the right choices. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. Have confidence in the Lord, for he can heal the brokenhearted, restore the alienated, reunite the estranged, and forgive the wavered. Well, thank be to God, wavered. We're going to celebrate Holy Communion. Hear this introduction. God prepares the table for us, offering us a feast of abundant love. Our cups overflow with the bounty of grace, for our shepherd knows us as no one else can, restoring our souls, healing our brokenness, nurturing us with bread and cup for a life of ministry. Come to the table and feast with the shepherd. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. And when we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, brought us to a land flowing with milk and honey, and set before us the way of life. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. And by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. And as his ascension, at his ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign with you at your right hand. And on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is that. 
Christ is risen. Christ will come. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body of, and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Until Christ comes in his final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. And the church says, amen. Because there is one loaf. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is the sharing the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is sharing in the blood of Christ. Well, those who are going to serve communion, please come forward.
eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. We stand as you're able. Our closing song is We Believe. We Believe. time of desperation All we know is doubt and fear There is only one foundation We believe We believe In this broken generation dark you help us see there is only one salvation we believe we believe we believe in god the father we believe in jesus christ we believe in the holy spirit and he's given us new life We believe in the crucifixion We believe that he conquered death We believe in the resurrection And he's coming back again So let our faith be more than him songs we sing. we sing, and our weakness and temptations, we believe, we believe, we believe in God the Father, we believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given We believe that he conquered death We believe in the resurrection And he's coming back again Let the lost be found and the dead be raised In the here and now let love invade That the church love, love our God will see We believe, we believe And the gates of hell will not prevail For the power of God So as you have been fed at the table, go feed the hungry. As you've been set free, go set free the imprisoned. As you have received, give. As you have heard, proclaim. And the blessing that you have received from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen? Amen. Go in peace, saints. Go in peace. We believe in God the Father.